little cutie patootie math angel. Welcome or welcome back. This is decaf math ASMR. I hope that you're doing well. Today I'm going to be chatting about this awesome pattern of numbers, also known as Pascal's Triangle. Pascal's Triangle. We're going to take our time today and kind of go over the basic algorithm as though we are creating and recreating this triangle from scratch. And then I'll mention some basic notation and just leave some food for thought that we can come back and revisit in the context of the binomial theorem which is very closely related to this triangle. So, I welcome you to just sit back, relax. As usual, this is not a formal lecture or lesson or anything. You can follow along, maybe review, maybe learn something new, but you are equally welcome to just close your eyes, zone out if you want to, or even drift off to sleep. That is perfectly okay here. There's never any pressure. So thank you for sharing this quiet moment with me. I hope that it blesses you, encourages you in some way, and let's get started. So first of all, I have a pre-written Pascal's triangle, at least the first several rows here drawn out so that we can actually see that it's a triangle. Kind of takes on this triangular shape, but it does keep going. So we can just keep going infinitely with however many rows we want. So this is more of an algorithm, a general visualization of this pattern. So what we tend to do is, if we were to do this from scratch, is start from the top of the triangle. So we're just going to do this row by row. And so you start with the one at the very top, just know that. And then the next row is one, one. So there's no calculation or anything to do here, just know that these are our first two rows are base two rows, and um, just as a side note for when we get to the notation, we're actually going to count this first row as the zeroth row, n equals zero, and I'll explain why a little later on, but this would be n equals zero, this is n equals one. So then for the next row, I guess this is all you really need to draw out your triangle. This and then how the pattern actually works. So for the next row, we always put one and one. So the far left and the far right is always going to be one. So from here on out, it's going to be like that. One, 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 and one, etc. So for every row from now on, we're going to have one and one on the outsides. So then going back here, we have one and one, but in order to get this number here, we take one plus one, and that equals two. So here we put one and one on the outsides by default. And then we do 1 plus 1 equals 2. So then for the next row, we have 1 and 1 on the outsides. So I'll just go ahead and write that in. 1 and 1. And then we do 1 plus 2 equals 3. Excellent. And 2 plus 1 equals 3. Awesome. So 1 Three, three, one. Indeed. Perfect. And you'll want to 
generally line things up like this. Keep in mind that we are trying to build a triangle here. So you want to line this up like along the diagonal and you want to have one plus two and then the three is in the middle. Just because if you don't, um, it can get confusing as you move down to the next row which numbers you're actually adding. So we have one, three, three, one. And then for the next row, we would put the ones on the outside again. And then you take adjacent terms and add them. So one plus three is four. Good. Three plus three is six. Excellent. Three plus one is four. Good. Then you have one. So one, four, six, four, one. One, four, six, four, one. And that's all you need to just keep on going. So if you were to build this downwards, you just have one and one, and then you basically add all corresponding, not corresponding, adjacent terms together to get a corresponding value underneath. So 1 plus 4 is 5, 4 plus 6 is 10, 6 plus 4 is 10, 4 plus 1 is 5, and then you have the 1s on the outside. So 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. And then you just keep going row by row by row, moving downwards. Okay? So here, because I have, you know, the first several rows, um, already written out. When we confirm each number, you're checking upwards, but when you're actually building it, you are adding adjacent terms and putting the sum below. So in other words, if I just have this 35 and I want to check this number, I look at the row above and I see the two adjacent terms that are right above this 35, and I see 20 and 15, and 20 plus 15 is 35. So when you check, you look at the row above and the two adjacent terms that are next to this value or whatever value you're looking at, but when you're actually drawing it out, you're adding downwards, you're moving downwards here. Okay? So here we have the first few, more than few, the more first 11, and we'll talk about if it's 10 or 11 rows here, but here, and then we can keep going. So we can do 1, and then 1 plus 10 is 11, 10 plus 45 is 55, etc., right? 165, um, 330, 462, etc., So now you have the basic algorithm, and there are actually a lot of really cool properties. So this is actually the reason why I wanted to print out like a pre-written one, because when you're adding step by step, it kind of doesn't really seem that interesting, I guess. Maybe you'll notice some patterns as you go, but when you zoom out, look at the triangle as a whole, there are some really cool patterns that can pop up. And for one, we have the two sides of our triangle filled with all ones, just because of the far left and far right thing being ones. And then we have this cool pattern, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And this way too, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, etc. and 11. And that's actually kind of obvious, but not necessarily obvious when you're adding row by row. But it's basically because of these ones on either end, when you do 1 plus 1 is 2, and then you add another 1 to get 3, 1 plus 3 is 4, 1 plus 4 is 5, so you're just increasing by 1 here. And same this way, on this other end, we have 1 plus 1 is 2, 
2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 1 is 4. So in this kind of zigzag, you're just adding one more. So we're literally just counting up by 1. And then we also have this 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, 28, 36, 45. Um, which might not immediately look like a pattern, but um, this is a difference of two. So one plus two is three, three plus three is six, six plus four is ten. So the difference is adding two, adding three, adding four, adding five, adding six, adding seven, adding eight, etc. Just because of this adding by these counting numbers here. So that's just kind of a cool pattern as well. Also, you might have noticed that there's a bit of symmetry. So with each row, there is symmetry here. There's a bit of repetition. And so for even rows, I guess rows with even number of terms, we have like 1 and 1 or 1, 3, 3, 1. So it's the 1 and 3 and then 3 and 1. 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. So we have 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. So the even, even number of termed rows are literally mirror images. But for the odd ones, we have like 1, 2, 1, or 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. So on either side, there's like a middle number, but then on either side, there's that symmetry. So 1, 4, and then 6 is in the middle, and then 4, 1, or 1, 6, 15, and then we have 15, 6, 1, but we have this 20 in the middle, but in either case, there is this symmetry going on, and that's simply because of the algorithm. We are adding the two numbers above, and for instance, 1 plus 2 is 3, but 2 plus 1 is also 3, because addition is commutative, commutative, which means the order doesn't matter. So like a plus b equals b plus c, or a plus b equals b plus a. So 1 plus 4 is equal to 4 plus 1. So technically you could do just half of this triangle, and then you'd have to do the middle numbers for the odd, odd number of terms. But is something interesting, I think. And then from here, there are other actually really fun patterns, um, just arithmetic patterns. Um, there's some hidden Fibonacci in here. There are some triangle, triangular patterns hidden in here. You can do some coloring exercises as well if you want to highlight different um, different patterns that you notice. We can come back and note some of them, but where I want to get to today is actually starting to tie this in with the binomial theorem, because I think um, those patterns are more based on the arithmetic, but this idea with um, the binomial theorem goes a little bit deeper, and so the key thing that I want to focus on today is um, kind of labeling each of these terms. And so there are two key indexes or indices that I want to keep track of here. And that would be, first of all, which row we're looking at. So if I just circled a random number, say 21, I should be able to identify this 21. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is label the different rows. And like I said, I am going to start with row 0, which I know seems a little kind of counterintuitive. Maybe our computer science friends would understand. But you start with 0, and that is just to keep it consistent with the binomial theorem. And we'll get to that. Just know you start with n equals zero. Um, and if for whatever reason you happen to learn that this is n equals one, it's okay, but your whole formula is going to be shifted down by one. So you might have like an n minus one in your formula instead. 
So this is more of the standard way of doing it. So we start with n equals 0, but this n corresponds to what row we're looking at. Um, so then this would be row 1, or rather n equals 1. The actual wording of that is just up to you, I suppose. But I'll show you what I mean. So then this row is n equals 2. This row would be n equals 3. This row is n equals 4, etc. Okay, so n equals 5. And so you should be able to count down to which row you're on. So just to keep it standard, this is how I like to do it. So if someone says, what is the third row, I would say that that corresponds to n equals 2, which is just n minus 1. But there is a reason for that, um, again, relating to the binomial theorem. So just do what, you know, your teacher does or do or make it clear with whoever you're talking to about this if you have a question about it or something. Um, just make sure you know which row you're talking about. But this is how we'll do it here. And this makes our formula way easier to deal with. So let's do that. So n equals 0 is the first one, n equals 1 is the 1, 1, etc. And then the next index that I want to put in is a k counter. And k is to count from left to right within a given row, and you're just going to index which term you're talking about. And again, I'm going to start with 0, and do k equals 0. Again, um, there is a mathematical reason for doing this, so it's not random. So for the first one, just k equals 0. Here we'll have k equals 0 on the left, and then k equals 1 for the next one. And we'll have k equals 0, k equals 1, k equals 2, k equals 0, k equals 1, k equals 2, k equals 3. So if you happen to enjoy coding, this will help you with each term. So each term should be unique in your n and your k pair. So you can just do this for any row here. Okay, so we have an n counter and we have a k counter. And the reason I want to be able to label each of these terms here like this is because it turns out, when we do this binomial theorem, it turns out that each of these numbers are actually n choose k. We have the choose function, which is written like this. You might see n choose r, but it's just your row choose whatever index you're on, and that's the n c r. Um, or in this case, NCK, but it's NCR on the calculator function, which is just N factorial over K factorial times um, N minus K factorial. Okay, and our factorials are, well, we've talked about factorials in the past, but just as a reminder, if I have, say, 4 factorial, it's 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So you take your number and you count down by whole numbers until you get to 1. Of course, multiplying by 1 is kind of redundant, because anything times 1 is itself, but just by the strict definition, you keep going down until you get to 1. Also, just by definition, 0 factorial is equal to 
1, which is a little strange, but we just define it that way. 0 factorial is 1, so you plug into this formula. So, let's say we have this number. So we would have 4 factor, so 6 should equal to 4 choose 2. Hopefully, we'll check it which is equal to, just from this formula, 4 factorial, so n is 4, over 2 factorial times n minus k, so 4 minus 2 is 2 factorial, and we'll work it out here, but we'll get extra practice with this in my binomial theorem video, but this is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 over 2 times 1 times 2 times 1. And the thing about dividing factorials is a lot of stuff ends up canceling. That's really nice. This one is redundant anyway. So we have 4 times 3 divided by 2, which is 12 divided by 2, which is 6 indeed. So 4 choose 2 is 6. So technically, we would have 0 choose 0, 1 choose 0, 1 choose 1, 2 choose 0, 2 choose 1 is 2, 2 choose 2 is 1. And it just turns out to work in this pattern. So 5 choose 0, 5 choose 1, 5 choose 2, 5 choose 3, 5 choose 4, and 5 choose 5 is just so cool and interesting to me. So besides just the arithmetic that goes behind this, there's a lot more to it, and as it turns out, these are, per the binomial theorem, these are the coefficients of different powers of a binomial. So, I'll have to write this out because it's just too interesting to me. But this is why I have n equals zero. So, for a binomial from algebra or whenever you learn about this, you have two terms that are added or subtracted together. So, I'll just call them x and y. Um, but I have something plus or minus something just to keep it in general raised to the nth power. So here, I'll do this, and in this case, we're talking about two different terms here, so this to the power of zero is going to be one, but to continue the pattern, if I have x plus y to the one, which is just x plus y, the coefficients of the terms are one and one. And if I have x plus y squared, and I expand that out from algebra, you can use the FOIL method, you can just remember this perfect square, you'll get that the coefficients of the terms, once you combine and simplify everything, are 1, 2, and 1. For here, we'll have x plus y cubed, and when you expand that out, the coefficients will be 1, 3, 3, 1. So that's why we have n equals 3, n equals 2, because then it can correspond to the actual power of the binomial. Now, there's a pattern for how the actual terms go. These are just the coefficients, but I thought this would just leave some food for thought. If you want to start with the first few examples, you could probably figure out the pattern yourself, but we will leave that for the next or another video. But I hope that this gets you started. We'll also break this down a little bit more, but um, who knew that all of this could come out of simply adding numbers like this, right? I hope that you find this interesting or relaxing or whatever, I guess. I think it's just really cool that 
something that seems so just arithmetic based can really be worked into something more complex like this and we'll come back and actually fill in the actual terms via the binomial theorem but we have the key parts to this now and we can also work through some actual algebraic examples too because sometimes we don't have just x and y sometimes our terms are a little more complicated um like i don't know like negative three z squared plus something something like that um but we can apply this general idea so if you're asleep right now i'm wishing you sweet sweet mathy dreams if you're continuing with the rest of your day i hope it's a good one thanks for relaxing with me with another little math session and i will catch you more for asmr math and math asmr in the future okay take good care